destined for championship glory. The worst moment for Chicago hockey fans was the 1971 Stanley Cup Final against the hated Montreal Canadiens. Without air conditioning at Old Chicago Stadium, the Hawks were the home team during Game 7 of the Finals against the Canadiens. Jumping out to an early 2-0 lead, legendary netminder Tony Esposito couldn't stop Jock Lamar's 60-foot away snapshot, giving the Canadians their first goal of the contest. Chicago Tribune writer Bob Bernie said there was a humid haze hung over the ice, but Esposito refused to blame the rink's lack of air conditioning on the soft goal he gave up. He had a point since Lamar's shot was nearly from the center line. The Canadians never looked back and scored twice more to upset the Hawks and win 3-2 on Chicago's home ice. Since then, the Hawks have never been closer to winning the Cup as they were that day in 1971. That is, until tonight anyway. As painful as it was in 1971, Hawks fans who were still alive in 1992 had to be devastated at what happened next at Belfour and Dominic Hasek. Incredibly, Eddie the Eagle, Belfour, and Dominic the Dominator Hasek were both on the Blackhawks at the same time. Two future Hall of Fame goalies were both on the Hawks, and yet the franchise still couldn't win a Stanley Cup with either netminder. Belfour was the starter during the brief Belfour Hasek years. The Hawks made the 1992 Stanley Cup Championship round with Belfour and Hasek both on the roster. It was also a Chicago team with Chris Chalios leading the defenseman and forward Jeremy Roenick was on this Hawks team as well. Led by Captain Dirk Graham, the Hawks went on a very impressive winning streak in the playoffs. After falling to a 2-1 series deficit to the St. Louis Blues, the Hawks won their next three games against the Blues, as well as back-to-back -back series sweeps against the Detroit Red Rings and the Edmonton Oilers. Just like that, 11 consecutive victories saw the Blackhawks four wins away from ending up as the last team standing. The only team in their proverbial way? The NHL's version of the Super Mario Brothers, otherwise known as Mario Lemieux and Yammer Yager. The Pittsburgh Penguins were the defending cup champions, and after nearly beating the Washington Capitals in Game 7 during Round 1, the Pens found their way in the finals thanks to winning 8 of their last 10 games. Hasek was probably Chicago's better goalie entering the playoffs as the Dominator earned all rookie honors and went 10-4-1 during his 15 starts between the pipes. Between a contract holdout from Belfour and Crazy Eddie missing games this season due to personal reasons, Hasek was turning into a fan favorite while Belfour was the more controversial choice in net. However, head coach and general manager Mike Keenan stuck with Belfour throughout the playoffs. He turned out to be the best cold ender in the postseason not named Tom Barrasso. The problem is Barrasso plays for Pittsburgh, so it was up to Roenick and company to find consistent offense against the Eastern Conference's best goalie. It looked like the Hawks had the Pens right where they wanted them when they took a 4-1 lead during Game 1. But the hockey gods haven't liked Chicago since 1961. Whenever the Hawks can blow a postseason lead during crunch time, they like to do it. The Pens scored four unanswered goals on their home ice, including the game winner with just 13 seconds left in OT. A crushing 5-4 loss for the Hawks, and they never rebounded from it. It was a sweep for the Pens as the Penguins celebrated their championship victory at Chicago Stadium. Hasek even showed during the series that he still had some raw rookie moments, but Belfair clearly wasn't himself. Hasek subbed in for Belfour in Game 4 after Eddie the Eagle gave up two goals on just four shots on goal. Keenan had a tough decision to make between keeping Hasek and Belfour, but with Belfour one year removed from winning the Vezina and Williams M. Jennings trophies for best goalie, Keenan had no choice but to allow Hasek to become expendable. The Sabres then cashed in on the young goalie's athleticism by fleecing the Hawks with a terrible trade request. The Sabres received a future Hall of Famer in Hasek, and the Blackhawks received just future draft considerations and a goalie in Stefan Beauregard, who never played a single minute in the goalie crease. The future draft considerations eventually led to the Hawks drafting Eric Daze in the fourth round. Daze became an all-star left winger, but serious back and herniated disc issues saw the team's promising winger limited to just 74 games in three seasons after his all-star game appearance in 2002. He retired after playing just one game in 2005. That being said, Keenan didn't want there to be a locker room controversy between Hasek and Belfour, and it's easy to say in hindsight when no one knew how great Hasek would become. Unfortunately, Belfour wouldn't even finish his career in Chicago. The Hawks were worried that he would resign with the team, so they shipped him off to San Jose for three players I personally never heard of until I googled them. Ulf Dahlin, Michael Sikora, and Chris Terreri. Terreri was put in the very tough position of trying to fill Belfour's shoes in net. He never got close to reaching Belfour's milestone achievements. Blackhawk fans kept asking themselves, is this team curse? 
the 1999 Stanley Cup Final pitted Belfour against Hashik as the Dallas Stars took on the Buffalo Sabres. Belfour eventually won the Cup over Hashik in the series, although Hashik won more Cups than the Eagle once he began playing for the Red Wings. The Blackhawks managed just one more Western Conference Finals appearance with Belfour net, and they wouldn't get back to the Western Conference Finals until last season. No one ever wishes someone to die, but success seemed to reach the Blackhawks once Bill Wirth passed away from complications of cancer on September 26, 2007. His son, Rocky Wirth, took over the team, and during their first season with Rocky as the CEO, the Hawks finished above 500 for the first time in six years. With John McDonough as the president and Joel Quenville as the head coach, the Hawks made it back to the playoffs and finished in the Final Four. The Red Wings once again got in their way and easily took care of the Hawks four games to one during the 2009 Western Conference Finals. Entering the 2009-10 season, the Hawks decided they need a veteran forward who could score goals and match up against their biggest rival, the Detroit Red Wings. Marion Hossa signed with the Blackhawks, giving the Hawks a formidable 1-2-3 punch on line one of Patrick Kane, Jonathan Taves, Marion Hossa. That is, if they ever needed to use all three guys on the power play. The Hawks were a tough team to beat in 2010, and they finished just one point shy of the Western Conference leading Sharks, but the Hawks were the better team in the Western Conference Finals and swept the Sharks to make it to the Stanley Cup Final. Their opponent was an unlikely one, the Philadelphia Flyers. Entering the playoffs as a seventh seed, the Flyers had little title aspirations, but after the top-seeded Capitals were stunned in round one to the eighth-seeded Canadians, there was new hope in Philly. The Flyers looked dead in the water when they trailed three games to zero in the Eastern Conference semifinals. But Simone Gagne returned for game four, and they definitely needed him as Gagne scored in overtime to force a game five. Brian Boucher was excellent as the Flyers starting goalie during Game 5, but he had to leave the game early due to knee injuries. As such, Michael Layton finished off Game 5 as the Flyers new goalie and preserved the 4-0 shutout. Layton then got the start in Game 6 as expected, and he made the most of his opportunity by being perfect through 59 minutes until the Boston Bruins scored late. It was still a 2-1 win for the Flyers, and wouldn't you know it, the Flyers had a chance to win Game 7 and come back from an insurmountable 3-0 deficit. The Bruins actually led 3-0 in Game 7 at the TD Garden in Boston, but they simply couldn't avoid a significantly embarrassing collapse. James Van Riemsdyk, who didn't score a single goal in the playoffs prior to tonight, netted a very important goal late in the first period to give his teammates new life and ending the shutout attempt. The Flyers then scored three more unanswered goals to win a surprising 4-3 Game 7 over the Bruins, becoming just the third team in NHL history to come back from a 3-0 series deficit. In fact, this had only been done once in any other American professional sport besides hockey. The Boston Red Sox defeated the New York Yankees four games to three during the 2004 American League Championship Series. And now the Flyers are back in the Stanley Cup Final for the first time since 1997, looking for their first championship since 1975. The 1997 Stanley Cup Final was very interesting since it pitted the Flyers against the Red Wings with both teams being in the Eastern Time Zone. The Flyers got swept in that series with fans questioning if the franchise made the right decision, although years ago when they traded for former number one overall draft pick Eric Lindros. Lindros scored just once in that series against the Red Wings and it cost the Flyers a lot just to acquire him. They sent the Quebec Nordique six players, two first round picks and $15 million in cash for only Lindros. The Nordiques eventually moved to Colorado with the future Hall of Famer in Forsberg helping the Colorado Avalanche win two Stanley Cup titles. What did Lindros contribute? Just one goal in his lone Stanley Cup final and his constant bad luck of suffering concussions, he suffered four during his career in Philly, inevitably led to him being traded to the New York Rangers. The Lindros trade was a huge gamble for the Flyers and it cost them much needed role players they probably could have used during their playoff runs in the late 90s and early 2000s. However, the Flyers probably wouldn't have made it to the finals without Lindros in the lineup, so there's a lot of give and take when debating if Philly should have traded for the future Hall of Famer. In a weird twist of fate, the Rangers tried to trade for Lindros, which would have included goalie Mike Richter. Richter was huge down the stretch for the Rangers during the 1994 Stanley Cup Final, which they won, so Rangers fans are probably very happy with the trade with Philly that was finalized prior to the Rangers calling up the Nordiques. But the Flyers are finally back in the Stanley Cup Final, in large part due to the Flyers getting defenseman Chris Pronger in another blockbuster deal with Anaheim. It cost Philly two players and two first-round picks. History tells us that the Flyers love sacrificing the future for winning now, but this time around, it has paid its dividends in a big way. 
Pronger's 14 playoffs assists have allowed the Flyers to be one goal away from forcing a Game 7 in Chicago, their closest to a title in 35 years. The trade for Pronger was definitely an immediate success. Layton's three shutouts in the Eastern Conference Finals proved that he deserves to be in the league, but is he a franchise goalie? Not so much. One of the reasons that the Blackhawks are a goal away from the title is Layton can't recreate his magic from the previous round. In fact, Boucher relieved him in Game 2 and Game 5 due to erratic play, but head coach Peter LaViolette decided to stick with Layton in this pivotal Game 6. And to be honest, the Flyers felt comfortable about tonight. Both of their wins in the series were at home, and with the Hawks being led by two players under the age of 25 in Kane and Taves, they don't have a lot of experience in this pressure situation. It's up to former number one overall draft pick Patrick Kane and Captain Taves to finish off the Flyers. Otherwise, it's back to Chicago for a winner go home game seven, and Blackhawk fans know all too well how that panned out back in 71. All the pressure is really on the Hawks to close out Philly. They brought in hosts to be that veteran leader when crap starts to hit the fan come playoff time, and he's been very meh in the playoffs. The star of the series has arguably been the former flyer in Patrick Sharp, who entered tonight's overtime session of four goals, two assists, and a plus minus of plus seven. Sharp knows all too well how this Blackhawks team has stunk over the years as he joined the team during the 2006 season. With the flyer score late in the third period, thanks to the active stick of Scotty Hartnell, the Flyers can sense a late series collapse because their opponents are so young and inexperienced. But here we go. It's playoff hockey at its best. Tied at three to overtime, one team can force a game seven while another can win its first title in almost 50 years. Can the Flyers force a game seven and remind their fans of Broad Street Bullies who won back-to-back -back cups in the 70s? Or will the Blackhawks finally appease the hockey gods and give their fans a much-deserved championship? It's golden goal format and Patrick Kane has the puck deep in the Flyers' end. Welcome to a moment in history. Here's Campbell handing on to Kane again. Lots of head fakes there trying to shake Demon. Threw one in front. They, oh my, it rattled around and it kicked on back. And they score! We saw no light. We saw no signal. And we're not sure if they've set a signal of a goal yet. But they are celebrating at the other end of the ice. What chaos! Thanks for watching our NHL version of Rewinder. Make sure to comment below and subscribe to Sports Broadcast Solutions. It's October 1st, 2007. Game 163 is taking place between the Colorado Rockies and the San Diego Padres. It's in the bottom of the 13th inning, a tie score at 8-8. The winner of this game gets a date with the Philadelphia Phillies in the National League Division Series. This is obviously a must-watch TV baseball game. I mean, who doesn't want to watch a one-game playoff that goes into extra innings? However, to fully appreciate what happens next, we have to know the history of both franchises. We have to understand that neither of these ball clubs have won a World Series. Even crazier, one of these teams hasn't even won a postseason series. To get a better grasp of this moment, we need to use a time machine. In other words, we need to rewind. The Rockies have Matt Holliday on third base and less than two outs. This is crucial because any fly ball to the outfield can theoretically send the Rockies to the National League Division Series on sacrifice fly. However, the mere fact that the Rockies are hosting this one-game playoff is crazy to think about. Back on September 15th, the Rockies were just 76 and 72. Yeah, you heard me right. Just 16 days ago, the Rockies were barely above 500. So how the heck are the Rockies even tied with the Padres for the National League Wild Card spot? As Al Davis would say, Just win, baby! <laughs> Just win, baby. Yeah, the Rockies have sure won a lot of games lately. An unfathomable 10-game winning streak from September 16th until September 27th saw the Rockies go from four and a half games back of the Padres to just one. In a twist of fate, the Rockies swept the Padres during that winning streak to get back into the NL wildcard race. But hey, that was just a lucky winning streak, right? There's no way this ball club led by Clint Hurdle could win two out of three against the first place Arizona Diamondbacks and sneak into the playoffs, correct? And if you answered anything but yes to those questions, you'd be dead wrong. Arizona ended Colorado's winning streak during game one of the crucial three-game set, but after dominating the Diamondbacks 11-1 on September 29th, the Rockies held on for a 4-3 win on the last day of the regular season. Nail-biting wins have been nothing new to the Rockies and their fan base. One of their wins during the 12-1 finish to the regular season included a 14-inning victory over the Padres. But have the Rockies simply taken the wild card away from the Padres? Or did San Diego majestically crumble down the stretch? Well, it's a little bit of both. Entering MLB game action on September 16th, the Padres were 80-67. They ended up finishing the year at 89-73. 
So a 9-6 and six record in their last 15 games is nothing to be embarrassed about from your ballplayers, but a three-game sweep at the hands of the Rockies was still pretty bad, especially considering that all three games were at Petco Park. Also, the Padres had the Brewers down to their last strike on September 29th, but Tony Gwynn Jr. knocked a game-tying triple off Trevor Hoffman to send the game into extra innings. How brutal irony is that? The son of the greatest Padre ever quite possibly stopped you from going to the playoffs. What gets lost in the shuffle is that the Rockies were actually a third-place team in the wildcard race prior to their incredible finish. The Dodgers were up three games on the Rockies after all the games concluded on September 15th. So what the heck happened to the Dodgers? It's hard to exactly say why they simply forgot to play baseball, but their final record speaks for itself. On September 15th, the Dodgers were 10 games over 500. By September 30th, the team barely finished with a winning record at 82 and 80. You can't make this stuff up. The Dodgers went from 79 and 69 and just one and a half games back on San Diego for the wild card spot to finishing seven games back of both Colorado and San Diego. Colorado literally had to sweep Los Angeles to knock the Dodgers out of the playoffs, and the Rockies did just that from September 25th until September 27th. The Dodgers might be known for playoff choking nowadays, but late season chokes are nothing new to the Dodger faithful. Anyway, back to the Padres and Rockies. The Rockies were 12-1 down the stretch, but a minor choke job by the name of Ron Burgundy allowed Colorado to host a one-game playoff. The Padres were two games ahead of the Rockies on September 29th, meaning they just had to win either of their next two games against the Milwaukee Brewers or one Rockies loss the next two days clinched a wild card spot for Bud Black's team. The 2007 Milwaukee Brewers were actually in first place of the NL Central Division during most of the regular season, but a late surge by the Cubs, as well as a collapse, saw the Brewers outside of the playoffs for yet another year. They still played spoilers, though, and after dispatching the Padres in 11 innings on September 29th, the Brew crew disallowed September 30th from being the Padres' clinch day. A very convincing 11-6 win for Milwaukee as the Padres had to fly from Milwaukee to Denver for a National League West grudge match. Just like that, Game 163 determined who would win the National League wildcard. This was huge for Rockies fans as their favorite baseball team hadn't sniffed the postseason since 1995. Colorado began as an expansion franchise in 1993, and the Rockies earned the first ever NL wildcard spot in 1995. The Rockies fought hard in the division series against the Atlanta Braves, but the eventual World Series champion Braves took care of the Blake Street Bombers three games to one. But since then, the Rockies have always found ways to lose games. More importantly, it's their pitching staff who seemingly always lets them down. Even when the Rockies won the wild card in 1995, you probably don't know any of their starting pitchers. Kevin Ritz, Bill Swift, and Marvin Freeman were arguably their three best pitchers that season. Colorado was so desperate for starting pitching help that they signed Mike Hampton to an unreal eight-year, $121 million contract after the 2000 season concluded. All of the money in Major League Baseball is guaranteed, by the way, so why would the Rockies sign a pitcher to an eight-year deal? Simply put, it's hard to find free agent pitchers who want to pitch in Coors Field, the home ballpark of the Rockies where the ball hits the mile-high wind and sails out of play. If you don't remember Mike Hampton playing for the Rockies, you're not the only one. He only lasted two years in Denver, with his last season being a dreadful 6.14 ERA and opponents batted 313 against him. So for the Rockies to be successful, they usually need to outslug teams. But that wasn't exactly the case in 2007. Jeff Francis won 17 games for the Rockies this season. Ubaldo Jimenez was on this team, and the relatively unknown Aaron Cook posted an ERA under 4.2. In a nutshell, this surprising Rockies team can play a little small ball and outpitch teams as well. But tonight has been anything but a pitcher's duel. In a typical Coors Field shootout, the Rockies blew an early 3-0 lead. The San Diego Padres swiftly answered with five runs in the top of the third, and it looked like the Padres finally hit their stride in this do-or-die playoff game. And while the Rockies are unknown for playoff success, the history of the San Diego Fathers isn't a happy story either. The Padres have been to the World Series twice, but they've only been to the postseason a grand total of five times coming into tonight. Since joining Major League Baseball in 1969, the Padres have mostly been an afterthought in the National League West. Coming into the 2007 MLB season, Bruce Bochy had enough with postseason disappointments and he left for greener pastures in San Francisco. Some Padres fans felt it was treason as Bochy led the team to division titles in 2005 and 2006. While they were back-to-back -back NL West crowns, the 2005 team barely finished with a winning record. And after being swept by the Cardinals in the NLDS, Bruce Bochy's team finished the year under 500 at 82 and 83. The 2006 squad was much better, but those pesky Cardinals were still too much for San Diego to handle. San Diego had home field advantage for the division series, but Bochy's crew only scored a single run in their first two postseason games. The offense was slightly awake when they entered Bush Stadium. A 3-1 win in Game 3 gave San Diego fans new hope, 
but it was quickly taken away during Game 4. Six unanswered runs by St. Louis gave the Cardinals the series win and yet another postseason disappointment in Southern California. Bud Black took the 2007 job after Bochy left for the hated Giants. Led by NL Cy Young winner Jake Peavy, the Padres were in first place in the NL West as late as September 3rd. Peavy got the nod for this one-game playoff. It was his turn in the rotation since he hadn't pitched since September 26th. But for whatever reason, the best pitcher in the National League was anything but clutch tonight. Three straight Rockies got on base to start off the bottom of the first, and after Yorvit Torrealba cranked a bomb to left field, the Rockies led 3-0 after two innings of baseball. Starting pitcher Josh Fogg was sent out in the top of the third to preserve the lead, but he simply wasn't up for the task. Peavy helped out his own cause with a leadoff single. Brian Giles found his way to first base with a walk, and after Scott Hairston hit a single to load the bases, Adrian Gonzalez emptied them with a game-changing grand slam. Fogg still couldn't settle down after the grand salami. Khalil Green and Josh Bard both got on base via the hit, forcing Fogg to intentionally walk Jeff Blum to load the bases. Brady Clark then made a solid contact with a ground ball to shortstop, and his speed forced the Rockies to just get the force out at second base. Just like that, it's now a 5-3 lead for Peavy and the Padres. Matt Sui didn't get anything on this throw. Blum was all over him. He was a little off balance after he came across the back to make the throw. But Peavy just couldn't keep the ball out of the ballpark. The Rockies cut the deficit down to one after Todd Helton belted the baseball to right center field and gave his home fans a lucky souvenir. An amazing game so far. It's not even the top of the fourth yet, and we've already seen three home runs, including a grand slam. Fogg was able to get a 1-2-3 inning in the fourth inning, but Hurdle wasn't pleased with his pitcher. He gave up 10 fly balls on the night when the wind was clearly blowing out, so he decided to go to his bullpen early. Peavy wasn't much better than Fogg tonight as the Rockies tied up the score in the bottom of the fifth. An early holiday for Rockies fans as Matt Holiday singled in Talowitzki for a 5-5 tie. Black was still confident in his young fireballer though, so he sent Peavy on the bump for the sixth inning. It was the same old story for Peavy as the Rockies retook the lead. Everybody was seemingly able to hit him tonight. Seth Smith hit the very rare pinch hit triple with one out. It was timely hitting all night for Colorado as Kaz Matsui got underneath the ball and delivered a sacrifice fly to center field. Another lead for the Rockies and this time around the relief pitchers were up for the task. After relieving Fogg, the Rockies bullpen held the Padres scoreless until the top of the eighth. The Padres were able to muster just two hits from the fifth inning going into the eighth. Taylor Buckholtz led the Rockies' bullpen by going one and two-thirds innings, allowing just one hit and threw 12 strikes on 13 pitches. But Brian Fuentes just couldn't hold the lead. After relieving Troy Hawkins with six outs to go, Fuentes was a tad bit wild and inaccurate. Blum got the much-leaded leadoff single, and although Fuentes got the next two batters out, Tori Alba couldn't quite handle this one-two slider from Fuentes, allowing Blum to reach second base on the drop third strike wild pitch. On the third pitch of the subsequent at-bat, Giles potentially saved his team's season with a game-tying double to left field. A high pitch that Giles was just trying to fight off, and he did. Got pretty good wood on it, and maybe that's what fooled Holiday as it sailed over his head. But Hairston couldn't send Giles home after that, granted... Tulowitzki's dart from shortstop Helton's great stretch at first base was excellent defense. Neither team could score again in regulation, so we went to extra innings. The next three innings were full of drama as both teams had chances to score. San Diego had runners on first and second with two outs in the top of the tenth, but Matt Hergis jammed Giles and got the inning-ending ground out. Colorado had a golden opportunity for a walk-off win in the bottom of the eleventh. With Brad Hopp at the plate, Colorado had the game-winning run 180 feet from home but Joe Thatcher fooled Hop on an 88 mile per hour fastball to end the threat. The Padres had their own runner in scoring position with less than two outs in the top of the 12th, but Brian Myro struck out, and Michael Barrett grounded out to keep the score at 6-6. The Rockies went 1-2-3 in the 12th game as the game entered inning number 13. And this was quite possibly the greatest extra inning in professional baseball history. Five total runs would eventually be scored in this inning. With everything on the line, the offenses for both teams woke up in a huge way. San Diego struck first in the top half. Giles quite possibly had the game of his life by reaching base yet again. This time it was via the leadoff walk. Hairston, who was looking to make up for his anti-RBI single in the eighth inning, came up big with a giant two-run homer to give the Padres the lead back, their first one since it was 5-4. Julio then gave up a single to Chase Headley, so Clint Hurdle had to call on Ramon Ortiz to limit the damage. Ortiz kept the score at 8-6 with two flyouts and a strikeout but the Padres were now just three outs away from their third straight trip to the NLDS. 
In came Trevor Hoffman for the save. It's hard to believe that Black never used Hoffman prior to the 13th inning, but credit Black for thinking his team would have the lead in extra innings. A future Hall of Famer, Hoffman was on the last Padres World Series team back in 1998. He finished in second place for Cy Young voting on two different occasions. His last second place Cy Young finish was just last season where he saved 46 games for the division winning Padres. He's been very good in 2007, although his ERA has climbed a bit since last year. Still, he entered tonight with an ERA well under three and a two run cushion. Even though the Padres are on the road in a very tough environment, there's no way that Hoffman could blow this. And yet the average baseball fan was wrong again. Everything that could go right has gone right for the Rockies since the middle of September. So with that logic in mind, the hitting sticks were available to everyone in the bottom of the 13th. Back-to-back -back doubles by Mitsui and Tolowitzki put the tying run on second base with nobody out. And if you could believe it, another triple by the Rockies, this time by MVP runner-up Matt Holliday, put the Rockies in a great spot. For a team who was seemingly going to be fishing just two weeks ago, the Rockies are 90 feet away from heading to Philadelphia for the division series. With less than two outs, Black told Hoffman to intentionally walk Rockies legend Todd Helton. Not a bad decision, obviously, since Jamie Carroll was due up next and not Garrett Atkins. Even though Hoffman is facing the middle of the order, manager Clint Hurdle decided to have Carroll pinch run for Atkins in the bottom of the seventh. There was one out with Atkins at second base. While the Rockies were up by one at the time and needed some insurance runs, deciding to pinch run for your five-hole hitter is always risky. The Rockies, of course, didn't score that inning and now needed the little-known Carroll to drive the ball into the outfield for a walk-off win. Carroll wasn't exactly a threat at the plate. In fact, he was a borderline disaster when it came to offense. After batting 300 during the 2006 regular season, he was a major disappointment this season by hitting just 222 in 107 games coming into tonight. But tonight was a different story. His two-out single preserved the 11th inning rally before Hop inevitably went down on strikes. So as of now, Hurdle's decision to put Carroll in the lineup as a substitute is starting to look okay. And with nobody out, all Carroll needs is a fly ball. But is Holiday the right guy to score the winning run on a potential sacrifice fly? Haha, -ha, absolutely not. He only stole 11 bases during the year and was caught on four of those attempts. However, his base running IQ was off the charts during his prime, as he stole 28 bases on 30 attempts in 2008. Well, here we go. It's the first pitch of the at-bat. Can Hoffman jam the non-explosive Carroll into a ground ball with the infield now in? Will Holiday run on contact? If the ball is hit into the outfield, can the Padres outfielders throw out Holiday and keep their team alive? Welcome to a moment in history. To right field, Giles is there to make the catch. Tagging is Holiday. The throw to the plate. He is safe. The Colorado Rockies are the National League wild card winners. Hold on a second, did Holiday actually touch home plate? Let's look at that again. I'll be darned, I don't think he touched the plate. Michael Barrett tagged him, but the home plate umpire determined that Holiday touched home base. This was years before instant replay challenges, by the way, so the Padres had to live with home plate umpire Todd McClellan's safe call. Murphy's Law to the fullest, whatever can go right for the Rockies has gone right. Rocktober began in the grandest of ways as Holiday's walk-off sacrifice fly run paved the way to seven straight victories and an eventual trip to the World Series. Since then, the Padres have only been to the playoffs once. The Rockies have played in two more wildcard games since 2007, which concludes an extra inning win over the Cubs at Wrigley Field. And the Rockies have won 14 of their last 15 games to get to the postseason. Little extra effort to get it done tonight.
It's December 28, 2003. The nine and six Minnesota Vikings are playing on the road. A win in this game clinches a playoff spot for the Vikes. And with the Cardinals entering the contest with a record of three and 12, it looks like Minnesota is headed back to the postseason. The ball is placed at the 28 yard line, but with the Cardinals down by five and under 10 seconds remaining, a field goal does them no good here. As such, it's up to quarterback Josh McCown to heave up a Hail Mary for the incredible comeback win. But a lot is happening here. In fact, there was a lot of drama coming into this moment. The mere fact that the Cardinals still have a chance to win the game is practically unbelievable. Before we find out what happens next, we need to understand where both teams currently stand. Nothing is ever simple in football, especially when it comes to a Hail Mary attempt. Win or lose, it's coming down to the last play for both teams. And for that, we need to rewind. The Vikings have a decent record at 9 and 6, but for Vikings fans who remember the 2003 season, they should have a lot more wins. Minnesota was once undefeated this season. Impressively, the Vikings won their first 6 games. But things started to unravel quickly for the Vikes. After a red hot start to the year, Minnesota dumped its next 4 in the toilet. Even more embarrassingly, only one of those 4 straight defeats was by less than 10 points. While it didn't seem to be a big deal at the time, loss number two of the four-game losing streak was a critical three-point defeat at the hands of the Green Bay Packers. This was huge because the Vikings outlasted the Packers 30-25 to during Week 1. If the Vikings had won during Week 9 against the Packers, they would have owned the head-to-head -head tiebreaker for the NFC North Division. This means that the Vikings wouldn't need to win on the road in Week 17. But the Vikings couldn't take care of business, and the losing continued into Week 12. From 6-0 to now 6-4, now the Vikings are 9-6. And, and if they could have just outlasted the Bears a couple of weeks ago, they'd be in the playoffs. Instead, Charles Peanut Tillman made the signature play of his underrated career as he overpowered Randy Moss in the end zone. And now, the Vikings need a win today to clinch their postseason tickets. Both the Packers and the Vikings were 9-6 coming into Week 17. So the Vikings need a win or a Packers loss to win the division. The old saying, every game matters in football, definitely stood the test of time for the Vikings in 2003. Still, going from 6-0 to 9-6 is technically a collapse. And this was supposed to be a new era of Vikings football and with Mike Tice as the head coach. Gone were the days of Dennis Green's Vikings blowing playoff leads or getting dominated in the tournament. Green's Vikings went 15-1 during the 1998 regular season but they couldn't finish the deal as the Dirty Birds Atlanta Falcons upset them at the Metrodome during the NFC Championship game. Didn't Green know the Dirty Birds, who he thought they were, but he still left them off the hook? But they are who we thought they were, and we let them off the hook. A primarily running team led by Jamal Anderson, the Falcons took advantage of a late missed field goal by Gary Anderson and then won in overtime. A crushing blow for the Vikings in 1998, but they were still good enough to get another bite at the Lombardi Trophy Apple in 1999. The Vikings offense was still as dominant as ever in 1999. While the greatest show on turf, St. Louis Rams, were the only team in the NFL with over 6,400 total yards, the Vikings still finished in top five in total yards at just under 5,800. However, turnovers were problematic for Minnesota in 1999. They turned the ball almost 19% of the time when they drove down the field. With Randall Cunningham struggling at QB the year before, Y2K, Green made a quarterback change and gave the keys of the offense to journeyman Jeff George. George was a former number one overall draft pick and he looked the part of a franchise quarterback in 1999. His Vikings went eight and two with him as the starting quarterback, with the Vikings earning a spot in the wild card round. They easily took care of the aging Dallas Cowboys 27-10 as the Vikings advanced to the divisional round against Kurt Warner's Rams. George was excellent on this day, but incredibly his four touchdown passes weren't nearly enough to outlast the Rams. A terrible day for the Vikings on defense as the Vikes gave up 49 points and five touchdown passes to the future Hall of Famer in Warner. If the Vikings defense had just been moderately respectable, they probably would have advanced to the NFC title game. Jeff George finished with 423 yards passing and 29 completions, but he also had 21 incompletions. The Vikings originally trailed 49 to 17, so to be fair, some of George's completions came during garbage time. In 2000, the Vikings truly believed the third time would be the charm. Choosing not to retain George or Cunningham, President Gary Woods saw enough in Dante Culpepper to allow him to be the full-time starter in 2000. Even though he didn't play a single snap the previous year, 
The 2000 season would be Culpepper's first year as the starter and his rookie season altogether. It turned out to be a great decision as Culpepper's Vikings won 11 games in the NFC Central Division. However, the Vikings lost their last three regular season games, allowing the New York Giants to clinch home field advantage for the playoffs. Whether playing in the Meadowlands was the key difference maker for the Vikings is debatable, but whatever the reason, the Vikings offense looked lost and bewildered during the NFC Championship game. A 41-0 shellacking in East Rutherford, New Jersey saw Jim Fossil's Giants play on Super Bowl Sunday and the Vikings crumble in yet another embarrassing playoff defeat. This is by far the worst of the three consecutive playoff losses during the Dennis Green tenure, and it begged the question, if not now, when would the Vikings finally get over the hump and back to the Super Bowl? A losing record in 2001 saw the Vikings gamble and terminate the consistent winner in Green. In came his assistant in Mike Tice, and the 2003 Men in Purple were once again contenders during Tice's second year in Minneapolis. But, as was the case under Green, this Vikings core always chokes when the stage is fully lit. And here we go again. From an 11-2 start to an 11-5 finish, the 2000 Vikings blew a chance at having the Super Bowl go through the metronome. In the 2003, the Vikings went from undefeated to being on the cusp of not even participating in the NFL tournament. Even if the Vikings don't allow the game-winning touchdown pass, the mere fact that they have to hold on against the 3-12 Cardinals is pretty darn head-scratching. But do the Cardinals have some individually talented players on offense? In two words, not really. While it's true that Anquan Bolden was on this team, the rest of the roster was very underwhelming to say the least. Bolden was a rookie in 2003, and the rest of his wide receiving teammates just weren't going to get the Cardinals over the top. Neither quarterback, Jeff Blake or Josh McCown, trusted any other wide receiver besides the former second round draft pick. Consider this, Bolden was targeted 165 times in 2003. No receiver received more than 89 targets. The little-known Nathan Poole finished with just 19 targets this season, but he was the go-to receiver on this version of any given Sunday. Bolden wasn't his normal self against the Vikes, as he has just five receptions for 27 yards coming into this play. However, Poole was up to the task and caught all but one of his targeted throws for 58 yards. Considering that Poole finished the year with 177 total receiving yards, it's safe to say he was having the game of his season. Almost 39% of his total season production occurred today in the season finale. The Cardinals led 6-0 at halftime thanks to two successful field goals from Neil Rackers. But the Vikings scored two touchdowns in the second half, and now the Vikes lead 17-6 with under seven minutes to go thanks to Aaron Elling's field goal. Can the Cardinals, led by McCown, score twice in six minutes and 48 seconds? Insert McCown. Week 17 of 2003 is just his third career start in the NFL, but he's definitely improved from last year's rookie campaign. In the two games that he played during the 2002 season, he completed less than 40% of his passes and finished with a pedestrian quarterback rating of 10.2. But the Cardinals had nothing to lose after being seven games under 500 when they entered week 14. With his team now in the double-digit loss category, Head coach Dave McGinnis gave McCown a chance by starting him in week 15 over the veteran Jeff Blake. Despite a sacked rate of under 5%, Blake's completion percentage of 56.7 this season wasn't enough to keep his job, and with the team at 3-10, it was probably time to start the young pup anyway. The Cardinals needed more than just a quarterback though, and after losing in week 15 and 16, Cardinals fans were thinking of a new regime and a new signal caller. The 2004 NFL Draft saw Ole Miss quarterback Eli Manning rising up the draft boards, and if the Cards and Chargers win today, Arizona would obtain the number one overall draft pick. The Cards were so bad in 2003 that they only won a single game in division play. But losing on purpose, aka tanking, wasn't the intended goal for Arizona late in the season. They just really stink. A team that was once 3-5 and five is now in danger of finishing the year with eight consecutive losses. And for Cardinals fans, they've seen enough of Josh McCown to be happy with Eli Manning as the franchise's number one draft pick come April. However, McCown showed signs of promise on the drive following Minnesota's field goal. Needing a touchdown to make things interesting, McGinnis had no choice but to go for it on fourth and six at their own 44-yard line. Mr. Consistent Anquan Bolden made a huge catch and his dive at the chains was enough to create a new set of downs for the home team. However, with only one timeout left, the Cards still had to recover the onside kick. The Vikings knew this, so they played conservatively on defense and forced the Cardinals to kill the clock with dumps and dunk passing plays. A couple of costly penalties by the Vikes allowed the Cards to keep the drive alive, 
Even so, McCown's touchdown pass in the red zone happened with just 1 minute 54 seconds remaining in the fourth quarter. Even if the Cards convert on the two-point attempt, they still have to have a successful onside kick. It was still a big two-point conversion attempt, and just like it's been the case their last seven games, the Cards couldn't make a big play in crunch time. McCown dumped it off to Emmett Smith, but E.J. Henderson greeted him in the flat for a huge open field tackle. Even if the Cards get the onside kick, they need a touchdown to win it. The Cards haven't recovered an onside kick all year, but this is also a Vikings franchise who has crumbled late in ballgames the last five years. And wouldn't you know it, when all they needed to do was catch a kick 10 yards away from the tee, they buttered fingered it and gave the Cards new hope. Even so, the Vikings had a 73% winning probability due to the Cards having an unproven QB and a talent devoid roster. But Vikings cornerback Denard Walker got beat by Cardinals wideout Brian Johnson and was forced to hold him for a killer penalty. Even on defense, the Vikings can't get out of their own way. Remember though, the Cardinals need six points to win. A field goal does them no good here, so the Vikings can still play a little conservative as long as the cards don't go out of bounds to stop the clock. McCown led his offense as close to the nine yard line, but the Vikings defense finally showed up with a big play. McCown took a sack at the worst time, forcing them to call his team's last time out at the Vikings 17 yard line. McGinnis is most likely getting fired on Black Monday for a lot of different reasons, but his clock management skills were also very poor. The Cards had to call a very dumb timeout early in the fourth quarter. As such, if McCown takes another sack, the Cards have to hustle to get the fourth down play in before the clock runs out. And wouldn't you know it, back-to-back -back sacks by the Vikings, this time by Lance Johnstone, forced the Cardinals into a 28-yard Hail Mary attempt. The Cards are lucky to have another chance as McCown got stripped, but Reggie Wells was Johnny on the spot with the fumble recovery. But McCown can't stop the clock, so after Johnstone sent him to the grass, the offense had to quickly get set and lined up. This is tough to do as the offensive line has to give McCown enough time to set his feet and deliver a strike into the end zone. Now, before we look at the final play, we have to acknowledge the year is 2003. During this time, the NFL allowed the most controversial rule outside of the infamous tuck rule. Until the 2008 season, the NFL allowed what was simply known as the force out rule. Here is the full iteration of the rule. According to this procedure, the nearest official could subjectively determine if the receiver would have had two feet in bounds if not for a push out by the defender. In essence, if the receiver had the second foot in bounds but was forced out while making the catch, the catch would count and the touchdown would be awarded. This is big because any receiver with great size can position themselves in a prime position for the force out rule to take effect. Bolden would obviously be the intended target on such a play. But considering that Poole has more receiving yards than Anquan, Poole might be the best option on the Hail Mary prayer pass. So here we go. Can the Vikings knock the ball down and advance to the playoffs? They have to win today as the Denver Broncos got absolutely destroyed in Green Bay. Or can the Cardinals snap their seven-game losing streak with an incredible Hail Mary finish? Does McCown trust more in Bolden, or will he throw it to Poole? Bolden has been one of NFC's best wide receivers during his rookie season, and a TD reception would give him over 1,400 receiving yards for the season. However, Poole has 58 yards receiving to just 27 from Bolden. In fact, Poole has more receiving yards this afternoon than Randy Moss. It's the last play of the game, regardless of what happens next. Welcome to a moment in history. There's back nobody there. inside the 10. Get back, guys. Here it is. The season's on the line. Two receivers left and right. McCown takes the snap. He steps up. He's all by himself. Fires into the end zone. Caught! Touchdown! No! No! The Cardinals have knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs. I believe it was caught by Nate Poole. He's being mugged by his Cardinal teammates. There are Minnesota Vikings crying on the field. I sure hope that you enjoyed our latest edition of Rewinder. Make sure to subscribe and comment below. Sports Broadcast Solutions is a broadcasting network for everyone. At SBS, we offer a professional broadcasting experience for the non-professional athlete. Just like the pros, we offer everything for you. Play-by-play -play commentary. A no-hitter at Kane County Stadium. 
15 strikeouts, one walk, one air, and that's it. Color commentary, highlight reels, recruiting videos, and much, much more. Unlike our competitors, we zoom in on the action and always have a live scoreboard with a live time code. If you're ready to have your next sporting event feel like CBS Sports, then make sure to call Sports Broadcast Solutions today. Our phone number is 330-957-7653, or you can go online to sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. SBS, a broadcasting network for everyone. It's time for another edition of SBS Basketball. It's Papa Flesses White against St. Peter's and Paul. I'm Kyle Smith alongside Lucas Moore. Our executive producer, Mark Carmen, and our videographer, Liam Crowdy, for another edition of the NHIBT. And because of that double overtime game we had earlier, Lucas, this game was a little bit behind, but that's all right. We get to watch more basketball. The game that was before us was running a little bit late. Yeah, no problem. And, and if this bleeds into the final four at all for those basketball fans watching it'll only bleed into the first couple minutes so it's it's not a problem at all and everybody here will get to watch I, I think this is the best final four upcoming in like the history of the tournament at least in my life i you know what i i hate blue bloods going to the final four you know what i don't care about ratings i love when butler was in it i love when it was butler against vcu you know, as America didn't like it, but I liked it. As, as a man who runs a sports broadcasting network, the fact you just said I don't care about ratings, it's impressive. Don't care. <laughs> I no, don't, I you don't care about CBS's ratings, of For course sure. not. Of course but, not. Like, how how is that fun? Oh, Duke is in the Final Four for the thirtieth time. North Carolina is in for the sixtieth time. Cool. It's like watching the Yankees against the Phillies in the I don't World know, Series. But they've never played. Cool. Duke uh, North they're, Carolina they play never twice played. Every year, I don't care. Well, they never played at this level, in the Final care Four. In the Final Four. It's I don't like I don't watching know. Blue Buds in the Final Four. It's the same thing goes with professional sports. If the Mariners played the Nationals in the World Series, I would watch that. I would live for that. If it was Mariners Rockies or Mariners Padres, I would watch it. Do I want to watch the Yankees against the Mets? No, I don't want to watch that in the World See, Series. I would rather watch Yankees Mets. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I don't like watching Blue Bloods that have been there before. It's Listen, not entertaining to me. As a storyteller. I love an easy story to tell. And the Duke, North Carolina story, in terms of storylines, you can't make it up in a book. We're going to go to break, and we're going to get a couple of pregame interviews with St. Peter's and Paul. Don't go anywhere. You're watching SBS's edition of Papa Flesses against St. Peter's and Paul here on our YouTube channel. Sports Broadcast Solutions is a broadcasting network for everyone. For those of you that just want raw footage of your sporting event, but no play-by-play -play or color commentary, you just need us to live stream video from the event over the internet. We will live stream your event on YouTube on our Sports Broadcast Solutions channel. In addition, 
We also have a dedicated channel on YouTube for live streaming at SBS Livestream. And if you need multiple channels, we can utilize Facebook Livestream and Instagram Live on our channel as well. Options include commercials from your sponsors, professional scoreboard graphics are still available, and of course, yes, pre- and post-game interviews are available as an option if you want. We've been working really hard this whole summer and stuff. Whatever your sports broadcast needs, we are at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. Check us out and become part of the digital sporting world. Hi, here with Sports Broadcast Solutions. I'm Lucas Moore. I'm here with Eleni. I'm here with Sophia. They're sweaty. Why? They just played a basketball game, obviously, and they've had a ton of fun here at the NHIBT. Tough loss in the last one, but how's this tournament been for you, Lenny? Have you, have you had one fun, and how do you think you've played in this tournament? Um, I've had a lot of fun in this tournament. I, this, Sophia's my cousin, and playing with her has been awesome. Um, I like meeting these girls that I'm going to know when I'm older and like experiencing basketball within a community. Yeah, and speaking of the community, that's kind of the entire point of this tournament, the NHIBT. Can you just comment on that community and, and what it means to you, Sophia? Yeah, it's nice being around people who share the same uh, religion and culture that's so widely respected around the world. And it's just fun being with these girls that I've really never met before and playing basketball, a thing that I love to do. Now, who do you guys, like, in terms of the NBA, because, you know, I, I think that there's one obvious player that's made Greek basketball a lot more significant throughout the world. Um, but, like... In terms of when your love of basketball grew, has it been there since day one? Uh, how long has it been there? Um, I've had a rough l relationship with basketball. Like, it's never, it's been, I've always been more into like a different sport, but through this like experience, I've learned to love it even more. And it's been, it's been a ride. Same question for you, Sophia. I mean, where's that love from basketball come from? Any idols, role models, or? or well, it's amazing watch, watching Yanni Antetokounmpo, obviously a Greek guy, um, dominate the league. Um, I see a lot of inspiration from him. Um, and yeah, watching basketball, I've kind of grown up around it and sports I've always been involved with. Family, community, building relationships. I mean, that's what basketball, that's what sports is all about. Thank you so much, guys, for joining Thank us you. in the post game. I'm Lucas Moore. This is Sports Broadcast Solutions. Missing your child's sporting event just plain stinks. But you don't have to worry about that anymore, thanks to Sports Broadcast Solutions. SBS is a live broadcasting network, as well as covering your on-demand needs, recruiting videos, highlight reels, and much, much more. We can broadcast live to any website, and we also post as much on-demand content as you need. For more information about SBS, check out our website at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. Sports Broadcast Solutions, a broadcasting network for everyone. Sports Broadcast Solutions is a broadcasting network for everyone. Instead of spending hundreds or thousands with all these college recruiting sites, let us put together your college highlight reel. For just a fraction of your potential college scholarship and significantly less than these recruiting services, we got this. In addition, we put together highlight reels for teams, including high school, your club team, or travel team. Well, my teammate gave me a great pass, and I just took it. Other team slashed me, took the opportunity, Saw where the goalie was weak, and I just shot it there. Solon, O'Connor, and Marsh back on defense. And Marsh gets a blowout. We got a breakaway, a 2 on 0 A shot, and his goal! So, 3-3. Three to three. The power play was officially over. Whatever your sports broadcast needs, check us out at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. Check us out and become part of the digital world. Back to the action here at Sports Broadcast Solutions, and it's always fun to see our future being interviewed, our high school division. Great job, Lucas, as always, on the pre- and post-game show, and of course, that edition was the pre-game interview. Thank, actually, that was a post-game for the last game. Oh, it was well, Lenny, yeah, yes, the yes. Game. That's why they were sweaty. They'd um, already finished that, that match. I thought up. that their coach just drills them uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> when they're doing uh, warm-up. Would have been funny. I said, I said, you guys just played, didn't you? Uh, but yeah, it was a great interview and, uh, you know, really, what I really loved about learning about this tournament as we've been here is, one, the pride in, in the culture that is, you know, the National Hellenic Invitational Basketball Tournament. So what's that culture mean? That, that Greek orthodoxy, right? That you've got a, 
uh, Greek flag hanging in the gym, the Olympic rings. It's just, and they're, they are proud and, and they love bringing the community together and developing it and growing it. And you always love to see things like that um, because family, blood, our past, history, tradition, you know, those, those are things that'll last throughout all of time. So the fact that we're able to grow it in, in the space of sports, fantastic, excellent, and, and really fun to see and, and fun to watch everybody compete intensely while at the same time being a part of the same community. Now, St. Peter's and Paul are going to have a very low rotation for this game. They're going to run six, maybe seven. Papa Flessus White has a full bench. Do you think that's going to come in handy down the stretch for Papa Flessus when we get late into the second half? Well, it depends how good everybody on the bench is, but it is definitely an apparent advantage. Um, but we'll see. Sometimes if, if you've got players that are in shape, it can end up working out pretty well for you. Tip-off is won by Saints, Peters, and Paul. And with it right now is Canellis. Over to 44, that's either Garbus or Andrews. Three-point shot by Canellis, no good. They get their own board, 44 again, and 44 is Andrews. That shot is good. Early on, St. Peter's and Paul with a 2-0 lead. And we've seen this in all our games. It's going to be a feel-out period um, where there's a chance to get organized. Really, we've not seen the first field goal of any of these games go down yet. That was our first one. There's Sotoropoulos. We've seen her a lot in this tournament. Yeah, and you can tell that we're getting towards the middle end portion of this tournament and these girls have played some games just from the jump. I mean, you can tell that they're already kind of more into the flow. They're already ready to respect the space. They're ready to pace themselves up and down the court. Stuff you normally see about 10 minutes into, into each game. You're seeing now at the beginning. Papa Flesses White, the underclassman against St. Peter's and Paul. Shot no good. St. Peter's and Paul. Look at this baseball pass. They've got numbers. They've got a woman in stride, they find her. Jump stop, can't finish, keeps it alive. Long three-point shot, line drive shot, no good. Rebounded by Papa Flesses White. Ball loose, picked up by Papa Flesses and Papa Flesses. Bad pass, stolen, gonna be a breakaway layup. Oh my goodness gracious, you gotta hit that, Lucas. Yeah, a couple missed layups, you hate to see him go astray. And it's a little bit of the legs, both of them missed short on the underside, you gotta remember, Drive with those legs, get it off that top corner. Three in the key. Is that the new term for it? Because I've already, I've, when I was always taught it was offensive three seconds. Is it now three in the key? Is that the term we go with now? Uh, I think that's a slang term that I grew up with. I don't know okay. if that's any official term, but I know I've was I mean, it's right. taught I just, use I've, three I've, in the I key. I just was, I've never heard of it until you've done games with me, and I like it, three in the key. I, I was like always it. taught offensive three seconds. No idea where I heard it from, but it's just always been in my basketball vocabulary. You know, that's the, I always like to know the new slang the kids are using. <laughs> Shot no good. Rebounded by Papa Fles. Sorry, St. Peter's of Paul. Well, you know, with the new era of technology, the kids become different than the next generation much faster. Like, I talk to people that are two to three years younger than me, and they have completely different cultural identifiers and, and things like that. Like, for the longest time, I didn't know what DM meant. There's a long shot and good by Papa Flesses. That one's on you. If you don't know what an abbreviation meant, you can Google it. I, but, like, you could Google anything. The whole point is knowing, not, you know, Googling something. <laughs> That's true, but... You know, I, I love going to trivia night, and... They always say, don't use your phone. It's like an unwritten rule of well, trivia I, night. I, if we're competing, yes. But like in general, to learn a random fact, I think you, you know, you've got the knowledge of the universe in your pocket. Why wouldn't you utilize it? Remember, well, you're, you're too young for this, but Ask Jeeves, that's what was big for kids my age. Ask. Ask.com, ask, ask Jeeves. You probably don't know what I'm talking about. Oh, I've seen Ask.com. Now it's just weird questions on there that you can't Google. And, and uh, my buddy, on an April Fool's joke, he, he told me that Bing stood for because it's not Google. And for the longest time, that's what I thought it stood for. <laughs> right now, St. Peter's and Paul, look at that drive to the hoop. Points in the paint, four to two in favor of St. Peter's and Paul. These two teams working through tired legs, St. Peter's and Paul only with, I don't see that six player on the bench, Kyle. I don't know if. It looks like they're running with five right now. 
I've got six listed. You could always add before a game. So, I just don't see an extra player on the bench. I don't know if she's... Potty break? Something like that, or they could be running with five. And that's tough if you don't have any bench players. Up and down the floor. Shot is good. We're all even at four, but they're, they're hanging around with Papa Flesos with no bench players right now. Four for Andrews, all four points from Amelia Andrews. Bad pass, stolen away by Papa Flesos. Defender is there on her tail. Good stop at Starboo, shot no good. Rebounded by Saints Peters and Paul Canellos with the rebound. Now let me tell you why that was such a good fundamental play. Um, when you're going to steal a basketball, so many players reach in with one, one hand. Yeah. It's a natural thing to do. But you reach in with two, you're able to actually catch the ball despite the contact. And we saw Papa Flesos do that on that last possession, which leads to a steal and a spin out. And that's one of those classic basketball fundamentals that's kind of been lost with the, I don't want to say street game developed. I'm more the ISO flair type of basketball that's developed in this country is that two hand style, those little things that really help you. They've kind of fallen away. Papa Flesos, we saw them yesterday. They lost to the upperclassmen. It was a pretty highly contested game. Look at that steal and St. Peter and Paul going the other way. Breakaway layup for SPP and it's good for SPP. Good, good time that time, pushing off with the legs, making sure you're getting enough strength on the land. Timeout called by Papa Flesis. We'll take a 30 second timeout as well. You're watching St. Peter and Paul against Papa Flesis here on SBS. Missing your child's sporting event just plain stinks. But you don't have to worry about that anymore, thanks to Sports Broadcast Solutions. SBS is a live broadcasting network, as well as covering your on-demand needs, recruiting videos, highlight reels, and much, much more. We can broadcast live to any website, and we also post as much on-demand content as you need. For more information about SBS, check out our website at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. Sports Broadcast Solutions, a broadcasting network for everyone. Six four the score, twelve ten remaining in the first half. A little bit sloppy to start the game, but Papa Flesis has seemed to make the adjustments as the game. Yeah, is going I, on. I, don't, I don't even want to use the word. It's fatigued, right? I think both these teams are a little tired, and you're seeing that in the legs. And so it's going to be about focusing on those fundamentals more. You know, making sure that you're using both feet to jump off of, to where you can have your layups nice and strong, keeping your eyes on the rim, squaring up your shots. Open three, no good off the side of the rim. Rebounded by SPP. Saints, Peter, and Paul with a drive to the hoop. Canelos with the shot. And it goes down for Canelos. Double team comes. 15 foot shot, not a good one. And rebounded easily by Saints, Peter, and Paul. You're really looking to hit the rim on that shot. That time it didn't. Probably a good foul. If she hadn't fouled, it would have been a fairly easy layup, although it looked like the, the momentum of the play was forcing her underneath the basket. So if she hadn't fouled, maybe she, it would have forced her to a reverse, but I don't yeah. know. But the speed of the speed of Canellos is really what's disturbing um, Papa, Papa Flesos here. Is she's able to sprint up the court and really create a lot of problems for the defense and, and cross you up, whether you should foul, how far am I underneath the basket, because you're chasing. You don't know where you are on the court if you're chasing somebody. You know, Kyle, if you and I went down here and played a bunch of tag and you had your eyes right on me and I had you stop and close your eyes, you wouldn't know where you were at the court, right? You, if you're chasing somebody, you can't have much awareness about where you yourself are. And we've seen Canelos really force teams, this team specifically, to chase her because of her speed. Make a, make, make a very quick decision. Do I foul or do I get back on defense enough where I force her into a, in, force her into a reverse layup. 
And that's why I don't like defenders chasing. If you're a coach, you know where they're going. So teach them, don't chase, go to a spot on the court. Look at that shot by Bob Beautiful. Blesses. And you're seeing that they're realizing their legs aren't as strong as they were earlier in the day. So they're getting better bend. They're really focusing on the fundamentals. And that's why we're seeing some shots start to go down. Maybe a, mat, maybe a lack of communication between the two guard and the point guard. So for Saints, Peter and Paul, do you think they're going to have to not rely on the fast break as much because they don't have bench players to help them out if they get tired? Yeah, we'll see. I mean, as a coach, I just see what they can do. If that's something that you're going to have to adjust to on the fly with five. You can't really have a plan for it either way because you don't want to tell them not to play their game because it's working. Nice pass and stride, that layup's good. Honestly, Saints, Peter, and Paul should be up by two possessions or more. They've missed some easy layups. But like as a coach, I can't tell my team not to do that because that's what they're best at right now. Almost stolen away and indeed is by Saints, Peter, and Paul and they have girls on the break. Pass and stride, driving in, tries to draw the contact, does not get the foul, but Canellos gets the bucket regardless, 13-9. And just Canellis just does such a great job of keeping her eyes directly on the rim the entire time that she's ready to shoot. And they're just annihilating on this fast break. Canellos again, four of seven from the field. And Papa Flessus has seen enough. Kakonis and the coaching staff are gonna call timeout. We'll stick with the action. It's 15 to nine. We stopped playing at 838. Neither team has committed a, well, they committed at least one foul. They haven't updated on the board yet, but. 15 to nine the score. Yeah, three fouls for Papa Flesa. There we go, so Amen. three for Papa Flesa. And none for St. Peter and Paul so far. But 15-9, listen. I think your concern is really valid, Kyle, in terms of, hey, are, are we gonna be able to run if you're St. Peter and Paul like that the entire game? Are you going to be able to run the fast break the entire game with only five players? because that's the biggest advantage right now. As a coach though, I just look at everybody and go, just do it till you can. And then when you can't, we'll go ahead and approach that problem. So do you think Papa Flesus, once they see Saints Peter and Paul tiring, that's, what, that's when they're gonna pick up the pace and force Saints Peter and Paul to guard it even though they're tired? Yeah, and I mean, the problem is, is that I think Papa Flesa looks like the more tired team right now, despite more of the bench depth. So what I would want to do as a coach is with only five players, I would want to push the pace since I trust my depth a little more. But if your starters or those you put out there can't keep up in a fast break scenario and it puts you down six, then you don't really have that option to do. Leading score right now for Saints Peter and Paul Canellos. Andrews with six, the second leading score, and that's it. Nine for Canelos. And they haven't really needed much, partner, because of the fast break and those great passes in stride. And they've done, you know, they've had, other than the missed layups, they've been really fundamentally sound as well so far through the game. And I think with this Papa Flaces team, it's a lot of the problems we saw against the upperclassmen. Sophia Canellos is a senior at Glenbrook South. She played on the Titans. She has not played for the church since eighth grade where she helped win the Greek Orthodox Athletic League Championship. Happy to be playing alongside her cousin and friends. And Amelia Andrews is in eighth grade. She's a member of the St. Haralamos Church. She also played on the boys team. Wow. Likes to play softball and she wants to pursue both sports in high school, basketball and fast pitch. Now, par partner, why is Canellis so wide open on these fast breaks? Well, she's cherry picking a touch. Um, not in a bad way, not where she's standing all the way in the backcourt. It's just as soon she's as she's- reading it, she's the first one back, so she's just Well, it's it like, you know, it, it's like when you play on your My Player on 2K, because you have that <laughs> wide view, you can kind of see when, you're when your teammate's gonna get a rebound and just sprint them up the court. And Canellis is doing that, but in a more impressive way, actually being on the floor. And, and working from a first person perspective, which is much harder than that and wide view that you get in a video game. Papa Fless is having struggle with, you know, struggling with that. They gotta be able to get back quickly, know that once Saints Peter and Paul has the ball, she's gonna break towards the hoop. Yeah, I mean, that's gonna have to be an assignment for somebody. It's almost, 
the problem is that that's tough to give an assignment to somebody when you want to run an offense. Yeah. So, and, and especially if you're running, if you're running man-to-man, -man, that's tough because, you know, you're trying to find the man, and then you end up in bad matchups, and the, the best thing you could do is try to catch him cherry-picking and, and score and force him to play better defense. But, yeah, coach is going to have to sign somebody to watch her say, hey, she keeps leaking out. You can't let that happen. We've got a couple of Con Constantinopolis players led by head coach Steve Constantinopolis. But they have been quiet offensively. That free throw no good. Canelos, man, oh, man, is she putting on a show 11 points out of the 17 total for her team. Got to be at least eight of that on the fast break. Well, you know what? If they're not going to guard you, just run straight up and get the easy bucket. Look at that three. I don't know what they're putting in the water for Papa Flesses basketball program, but keep doing it because we have seen a shooting clinic from all the Papa Flesses teams from downtown. They all have good forms. They're well taught how to shoot the basketball. Just got to work on rebounding a little bit. As we saw in that Boston game, Boston was really taking it to Papa Flesses on the glass. Yep, and then we saw this team yesterday um, against the upperclassmen kind of be allowed to rebound, you know? Yeah. And, and and they weren't carving out space on the box outs or anything like that. But again, that's that's a skill, not a physicality. And it's often misperceived as a physicality thing. You know, I had a buddy of mine, he's six foot eleven, didn't make the high school basketball team because I'm a better rebounder than he is at six three. Because he doesn't understand body position. He gets beat to spots. He reads it wrong off the rim. And he would be the first one to admit that to you. So it's not always size or strength or anything like that. I mean, rebounding is an art. It is a skill. And one that takes time to learn. Just because you're really tall doesn't mean you're going to be a great rebounder. No. I dunked on him once, too. On an eight-foot rim? It was like nine and a half. <laughs> Stolen away by Saints, Peter, and Paul. And I, like, used his own, like, back a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Double team comes, trying to fight through it. Wide open three, can she nail it? No, and rebounded by Papa Flesses. PF with it. Love hearing the Saints Peter and Paul coaches screaming good shot, because it was. You want to take that shot, no matter the result of it. Foot might have been on the line, let's see what they call it, and it is a two. I don't know where you are on the court, but when you're that wide open, just take it and hope for the best. Yeah, you don't want to worry about it. You should. That should be more of a natural thing that you get better at doing that you're naturally doing. And you can kind of see as people orient themselves on the court. And that's kind of an underrated aspect of James Harden's game, where he'll, he'll, he has awareness, steps back, sometimes it's a travel, they don't call it, but awareness and getting that three. I disagree, that, that step back's not a travel, because the ball's in midair as he's traversing back. If you go look at that thing, it's it just is, just because it's weird, doesn't mean it's a violation. <laughs> Right, it's weird because he's a lefty and it's a really giant step back and it looks like he's taking four steps because he is, but if you are throwing the ball backwards and then taking four steps to meet the ball, you don't have to dribble every step. I mean, it's like throwing the ball in front of you on a fast break. I mean, those the ball's only dribbled twice. On, a, on an NBA fast break, you should only have one dribble with the, the, with the length of their legs. It's one dribble, maybe two, one, two, slam. You know, kind of similar concept with the step back there. Not to get on a soapbox. I like Canellis' free throw motion and her fundamentals. And I've always wondered this from a coaching perspective. Do you like that long arc on a free throw or just kind of something that's in rhythm and that you feel comfortable with at the free throw line? In rhythm and comfortable for free throws. I care less about the arc. I mean, generally you want the same shooting principles that you would have in the rest of basketball. But you want consistency and you want rhythm from the free throw line, however you find it. Stolen away by Saints, Peter, and Paul. Here goes SPP. Turnaround shot, got it! Close to a foul, nothing issued, it's 21-16. Great defensive play by Canelos to set that up. Papa Flesos with the answer. 21-18 and it's not the great half by Papa Flesos, but they've got the score close and they know, hey, there's nobody, there's, yeah. the Cavalry's not off the bench for Saints, Peter, and Paul, so they're gonna have to go with this lineup in the second half. We keep it close, we can kinda drain them to a point where they're just going to be dead tired by the second half. Well, and they, they're a good shooting team. 
I mean, they're, they're able to hit down mid-ranges. They're going to knock down some threes. They have good form. Um, they all shoot well fundamentally. And when you have that, I mean, that, that's the reason you could be down three and, and not feel like it's a, it's a really close game. And that's what kind of the deal was yesterday when they hung around against the senior team over and over and over and over again. You're like, what's kind of happening here? Good shot makers, you know, fundamental shooting. The easy stuff. It can win you a lot of points. Konstantopoulos at the line. That one's good. That's now two for Konstantopoulos. Both shots, of course, at the free throw line. You could hold for the last shot if you're Papa Flesses, and I think they will. Or a foul will happen, and we'll reset. You got two more. You got one more to give if you're Saints, Peter, and Paul. Obviously, Saints, Peter, and Paul would like to have a bigger lead with no bench today. Yep, bigger lead the better. Can feel a little more comfortable. Or you could always give a $50 bill to James Harden's uh, niece who lives in Illinois, have her, <laughs> have her come off the bench. Well, I'd go down there for 50 bucks. There you go. <laughs> I think I could get a few rebounds. Throw a few bows. You know. I, I heard you were quite the water boy during your prime. You got the water and we make sure to... No, man, I was a broadcaster. I was up at the stands. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I had a growth spurt like my junior, senior year, so I didn't really start playing a ton of organized basketball until I got into college and messed around with it and never had anything serious pop up. I was the third string water boy. <laughs> That's the layup no good. I mean, you know, my buddy was the manager of the basketball team. He ended up with six high school points. There you go. Because he kept getting put on the roster there. It's not, it's not how you score them, it's when you score them. Cut it out. You know, I don't know how many points per game that Robert Ory scored, but I certainly remember that three-pointer he made against the Kings in game four. And basketball could be a, a cool game like that. It's a beautiful game. And I could wax poetic about its beauty for a long time. Um, But it's got physicality, flair, style. You've got fast breaks like this. 15 for Canelos. I think her coach is happy she made the shot, but maybe next time go to the left with the layup instead of the... Oh, look at that! An incredible half-court heave at the buzzer. And Papa Flesses continues to be red hot from downtown. I mean, what a three. What a way to end the half. And again, this shooting is what keeps them in the game over and over and over again. And they're only down four. It feels like they should be down 10. For and sure. with, with a team with only five players on the court, Kyle, as you've been mentioning, could be an interesting second half. I, don't, I just don't know how Saints, Peter, and Paul know. I don't know their conditioning. I don't know what kind of drills they do in practice. But this is going to be a grueling task to play 18 more minutes. It's running clock. Too. So you don't really get breathers anytime there's a foul or a, or a ball that goes out of bounds, that kind of thing. So, I don't know. We'll see. But it would have really helped Saints, Peter, and Paul to be up 10 points instead of only up four. Definitely. You felt more comfortable. But you also have to take into account that comfort is not necessarily a positive when you only have five players that are tired. You know, if you have a guy on the bench, it doesn't matter what the score is. They've been waiting to play. You put them in, you're going to get energy. But if it's just those five, it's a lot more like soccer. Right? Soccer team goes up 2 nothing. Everybody starts kind of jogging a little slower and looking around. And you definitely don't want that if you're Saints Peter Paul. They've got to keep up the energy um, because they're like three three-pointers going down, a couple missed layups, 9-0 run, down by four, super tired. You won't be able to make the comeback. It always helps when you've got young guns off the bench that are not tired. And basketball has changed to the point that players have a certain role. You have, your, you have your starters, then you have your super six man, then you've got your backup center that's just in there to do certain jobs to help out your starter when your starter gets a little bit tired. But now you've got five people, so they all have to do starters role and kind of the bench role too because nope, the cavalry's not coming. It's yeah. five people and we got to find a way to win in the next 18 minutes. Well, and just you have to know how to pace yourself. You know, you're, Don't do anything you don't need to do. 
right? There's a lot of times you get on a basketball court, you're over the top with your energy, you do things you might not necessarily need to do. Maybe they're helpful, maybe an extra trap on the sideline, maybe an extra effort for a loose ball, but they need to make sure that they can still push the break because that's where their most effective offenses come from. And if they can continue to push their advantage on the break, they will be able um, to probably come away with the victory. But if they can't maintain the legs on the fast breaks, that's, that's the path for Papa Flesa to make sure they uh, come back in this game. We're going to take a 12-second break. We'll be back with halftime stats. You are watching Papa Flesis against St. Peter and Paul here on Sports Broadcast Solutions. This is Sports Broadcast Solutions, a broadcasting network for everyone. Check us out at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com and become part of the digital sporting world. Twenty-five seconds before we have second half of action. Here are the halftime stats brought to you by DCGreeks.com, the sports and information department. Fifteen points for Canellos, eight for Andrews. She started off with six to start off the game and then cooled off because Canellos was wide open on those passes down court. She got those layups and bunnies. And then uh, Soda Rapolos with ten. Stavros with seven, Lachos and Rofos with two apiece, and that's where we stand, 25-21 score. I still think Papa Flesis is gonna win this game, Lucas, but they gotta be more aggressive driving into the paint. You think Papa Flesis is gonna win, down by four? I just, I don't know if Saints Peter and Paul can manage not having any bench plays. I think I, I, think I see your argument, I see the path. Um, I just, it's gonna, be, it's gonna have to happen from behind the arc. They're gonna need to make their three-pointers. I think for Papa Flaces to win this game. I think Canelos is gonna provide problems. I don't think she's gonna have bad conditioning in this half. She's barely broken a sweat. So I, I, I think she's gonna be able to keep up that offensive pressure for Saints Peter and Paul. It's gonna be, have to be a team effort for SPP. That's not a good start for Papa Flaces. And here comes SPP. Three on three, good bounce pass to Canelos. Triple team. That's more of a pass than a shot. And this is where you calm it down. This is where you're up by four. You only have five players. Pass it around, find a good shot. Foot might have been on the line, no call. Does not get the friendly roll. All right, partner, you're the official underneath the hoop. Was there a wrist or was it all ball on the block? I think there was wrist there. I think that was a good call. And again, from up here, when I, the way I try to judge an official is by really more the context of each foul. I can, it's so tough to judge wrist from all the way back here that if a player is moving to and you feel like that, hey, that shot was going up, it was going in, and then all of a sudden it gets knocked sideways and their wrist falls right or left, I like to think it's a good call. 26-21, the score. Text line's open. Your favorite high school, college, or NBA memory. Text 330-957-7653. What's your favorite NBA memory? Favorite NBA memory, I think I have to go with that big shot Bob mo moment, Lakers, Kings. The tip, by, you don't remember it? I'll, sh I'll send you the, the link. Yeah, please do. After the game. Vladi Divac, as that shot is no good, rebounded by Papa Flesis. With two seconds left, all he had to do was knock the ball out of bounds. Instead, he tipped it towards the three-point line. Look at that move, my goodness. The dribbling for SPP has been Phenomenal today. Canelos almost gets the shot. No, second chance, yes. Now it's starting to get iffy for Papa Fles. A seven point deficit, how can they respond? Again, they, they're gonna have to make shots from the outside and they're gonna have to pass into those shots. In the paint, no good, no foul. On the floor and jump ball. Possession arrow and it's gonna be to Papa Fles. Mm. Nope. It's a St. Peter and Paul. They're so quick on those stats, I can't tell. <laughs> we gotta have that like little click arrow that they usually have at uh, the uh, coach's table. 28-21, look, look at that pass. She was double teamed, still threaded the needle for an excellent dime and the finish. I don't think it's gonna be a problem with just five and I think it's because of the energy of Canelos. She has all the energy in the world and she's what's running the offense. She's the engine that's making it go for St. Peter and Paul. 
So as long as she has the energy and is able to run breaks like these, they should have a lot of success. You ever seen a basketball game with that many breakaway layups? Not recently. Not, a lot, not recently. It's fun to watch. It's fast paced. Imagine a hockey game with that many breakaways. Two on one, here we go again. They're fun to watch. Saints, Peter and Paul. Jump ball, this time the possession arrow we pop places. 32-21, now what should Papa Flesses do here offensively? Offensively, I think they're fine. I mean, they're getting open shots, so keep it the same. Defensively though, if I'm a coach, I'm like, can we sprint back maybe? I know we're not gonna get there. I know they're out in front of us, but the last few, especially as Canelos has started to have success on these breakaways, you're starting to see it turn into more, I ah, she's gonna score. She scored every time. It's happened every single time. You can't allow that to happen. You gotta keep trying to see how much pressure you can put on opposing offenses. 32-21, we'll take a 12 second break. You are watching Papa Flesses against Saints Peter and Paul here on SBS. This is Sports Broadcast Solutions, a broadcasting network for everyone. Check us out at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com and become part of the digital sporting world. Thirty-two, twenty-one. So you asked for my favorite NBA memory. What's yours? Doesn't have to be NBA, by the way. It could be high school or college. Well, there's fun high school ones, but I'm not going to get into that. I'd have to explain too many of the characters for it to be good stories. Um, but in terms of an NBA, I was going to say the 2016 Finals. Of yeah, I'm from Ohio, you know, the LeBron James block, huge moment. But that's everybody's. Really, for me, it's the 2018 Eastern Conference Playoffs. Pacers, Cavs. Yeah, I remember that. And LeBron hits that fadeaway three-pointer at the buzzer to win. And I was at a full establishment in Athens, Ohio, um, which is obviously a big Cavaliers area. Yeah. And that place blew the top off. And I was standing on top of a table, peak of life. Weren't they down in the series when he hit that shot? Yeah, oh, massive shot. And that was a massive finish there. And if it keeps going like this, St. Peter Paul is going to really put it on. Yeah, they were down in the series. They had been struggling the entire postseason run. They needed every ounce of LeBron James, and he provided every ounce that he had. And that shot was just, mm. especially because there was a Pacers fan at the booth next to me yelling at me for the whole two hours of the game. So sweet justice as he slowly walked out of the chaotic scene. <laughs> that was the celebrations in Ohio. What a phenomenal basketball player LeBron James is. If he had gone to college, do you think he would have been good enough to single-handedly lead Cleveland State or Akron to the Final Four? I modern college, I don't know. Probably back then, maybe. I don't know. That's a tough question. I think so. I mean, we. But Melo did it with Syracuse, so it wasn't this. Well, remember when Antonio Gates led Kent State to the Elite Eight? Vaguely, yes, I do remember that. You were a little baby then. 2002. How old were you? I remember seeing four. You were four. Okay. In 2000, I remember seeing highlights of that though when I started watching football because Antonio Gates is big in yeah. 04, 05, 06 when I started really being a sports fan. It is possible. Gordon Hayward, of course, he also had Shelvin Mack on that team, but went to the national championship and then the next year, Shelvin Mack with Butler. It is a clinic right now on the fast break for Saints, Peter, and Paul, and they are showing when you're undermanned, it doesn't always matter. Yeah, play your game. If fatigue becomes an issue we'll address that when it happens but I'm really glad that you know and this is why coaches make decisions and not broadcasters because broadcasters we can kind of just see the superficial things if you're a coach you know work ethic conditioning level uh, mindset attitude you know everything you need to know to make the decisions for your team and he said hey we're conditioned enough to play with five let's run the pace try to get a big lead but to play devil's advocate for that Sometimes the broadcasters know that a team doesn't have zero, doesn't have any timeouts left, but David Blatt and Chris Webber don't know that. That's true. That's true. Hey, listen, it's it's a, it's a hard job down there to be a coach. 
It is a tough job, and I'm glad that Eric Spolster is finally getting the credit he rightfully deserves in Miami. He was getting a lot of the blame with the big three. and Well, so the thing about the NBA is it's a tough job, but I don't know how important it is at the end of the day for winning a championship. I think it's important, but Sup it's always been about players in the NBA. And at, at levels that high, it should be about the players. But what he's done, though, in Miami with the COVID issues. And yeah. it's it, They've had, like, three different rosters over the last 15 years. Again, but without LeBron James, Eric Spolster has never won a championship. So got it's, close, though. Yes, he did. And Jimmy Butler is a phenomenal player. He's not LeBron James. And, that and they was, got close with, with Jimmy Butler. And that was in evidence in that, during that series. Right. Although, I, you know, that was one of my – for a no-fans final, that was fun. Butler and LeBron going back-to-back, -back, throwing blow after blow. You know, and speaking of NBA Finals and what's relevant to this tournament in front of us, you know, they mentioned in the pregame how much a lot of these players look up to the current best player, undisputed, in my opinion, in the league, Giannis Antetokounmpo, who is, you know, right now lining up to win three out of four MVPs it's, it's and be the be true. Jokic. You can't. You got to give it to Jokic. Ah, uh, let's he's, not let's what, what not he's dive doing into without this Jamal year. Murray and Michael Porter Jr. and they're still a seven seed. It's simply remarkable. Well, I know I have the crowd on my side in this argument because I think Giannis I, is the look, bona fide I love MVP. And look, I know the he analytics is, aren't officially approved by the fans, you know, player efficiency rating and true shooting percentage and win shares. So the, I, I love them. And the reason Jokic dominates all those categories. The reason I don't like those is because it might do well for the top 15 players. But take like, go look at in the middle tiers of which players are ahead of each other in PER. And you realize it's a sham stat. A lot of times. It dominates every analytic. Win shares. Box plus minus. Mm. If they don't matter, why does BasketballReference.com have it and it's directly related to the NBA? I'm not saying it doesn't matter. But, like, Giannis has a great VORP. Giannis has a great win shares. Giannis has a but great... But he's not dominating every category like Jokic is. And he also has some players on his team where, as much as I love the rotation players in Denver, they're not Drew Holiday and they're not Chris Middleton. Uh, Jokic, to me, is a better defender. I mean, I'm, Giannis is a better defender. Oh, for sure. Giannis is a, I don't know, he's the best two-way player in the league right now. But that's not Jokic's job. His job is to do everything else. Yeah, but I'm looking for the most valuable player. And it's Jokic. <laughs> that's really not. I mean, what's going to happen is if you give the MVP to Jokic, he's going to crash out in the first round to somebody he finished ahead of because in the Because he's voting. got nobody on his team. His two best players are hurt. In the sport of basketball, individuals can win series. We've yeah, if known you're the that. greatest player of all time, LeBron James. Or like, you know, Giannis. He's got Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday. Oh, we disrespected Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday all of last year. I did it. I was rooting hard for the Bucs. They're my second favorite team. I love Giannis, but I, if we have the analytics, you have to value them. And I think that's why. Yoke yeah, but you don't have to pick awards based on them. Because you know who well, should have been the NFL year. MVP based on analytics? Joe Burrow. But nobody's well, talking about that. I would, I would that. argue Cooper Cup, but... <sighs> what, what analytic are you looking at for a wide receiver winning an MVP? They have these stats, like, is that shot's no good by Saints, Peter, and Paul. They, ha they have, like, route percentage, like, how good your route yeah, is. Yeah, I mean, he's great for wide receiver, but no wide receiver in the NFL. Like, Cooper Cup is more valuable than maybe, like, three starting quarterbacks. And I would that, love that's to see for Cooper points spread on analytics. the Bears and see how much Justin Fields' numbers would increase. It'd be interesting. I think marginally. I mean, Justin Fields has to be able to throw an accurate dig route for it that is, to it work. It is true. There's You can't defend a perfectly thrown ball. And I think that it's not a coincidence that Matthew Stafford, the two, mo the two triple crown winners in the history of wide receiver play, happened with the same quarterback. Like, Stafford knows how to get you the ball in the right spot, and if you're an elite player, he knows how to get it to you. Yeah, because they're wide open. They run a good round. Yeah, but those players played with other quarterbacks and didn't produce those numbers. Well, I Megatron didn't, I, I suppose. I like Stafford, but, well, we'll talk about That's a sports radio topic for another day. 45-25, <laughs> what happened to Papa Flesis in the second half? They, they had to tell you they had more tired legs than we gave them credit for in that first half. And I think that, that really played itself out here over the first couple of minutes. If you're just joining us, it was 25-21 at halftime, and just it kind of unraveled quickly for Papa Flesis in the second half. 21 points for Canelos. We'll try to get here in the post-game show. If we can, we'll get Soto Rapolos for Papa Flesis. 
So I misspoke in the pregame because Canelo's played in the game before and she was the one we interviewed pregame She's just a too. machine. So she was a post-game and pregame show at the same time. So. She does everything. Apparently. Oof. Uh-oh. Well, that was tough. Is there such thing as a getting chippy on a basketball court? <laughs> With that foul right there, a little chippy. A little chippy. No, but it's going to be... Uh, It's going to be uh, the Milwaukee Bucks winning the title again pretty easily. It'll be Phoenix. They're going to sweep the Bucks. I love the Bucks, by the way, but sweep the Bucks. there's no way that Phoenix is going to lose it this year. I've been wrong before, <laughs> only once. There's, I just don't see it. I don't see anybody beating Phoenix. And they've learned how to win from last year, how, how close they got. Well, I come, to, I come to this argument from a I did not think Giannis – and that's a nice job. Great job to get the ball away from the defender, finish to the left hand. I'm a guy that did not think Giannis had any business of being the best player in the league conversation all the way until game five, six, and seven of the last NBA Finals. But that's the thing is I watch the games. And that game five, six, and seven by Giannis is arguably the greatest three-game stretch in NBA Finals history. And, and that to me, and then what he's done this year, has really cemented him in my eyes with a 39-year-old LeBron and a Kevin Durant that can never stay on the court as the bona fide best player in basketball, undoubtedly, and by a decent margin. Imagine if Jokic was on the box, they wouldn't have lost a game in the playoffs. They wouldn't have been able to play any defense either. You know, the analytics yeah, The are... biggest play of the finals was a block. Yeah, that Jokic could have blocked. He could, he could what do block. you mean, with his six-inch vertical? He's up, he's in the top five in defensive rating. According to analytics. Oh. I just think a lot of people like Jokic because they see it and go, see, you don't have to run to be good at basketball. You can lightly jog Even and just be seven foot. Even if you go with the foot. normal stats, he's like eight point assists per game as a center, 25 points per game, 14 rebounds per game. It's just phenomenal. What can Papa Flesses work on for their next game, especially if they play a team that's short on the bench well I think they got to just get back to basics they got a little turnover happy they haven't gotten back well on defense but it's hard for me to judge because it's clearly tired legs they played a lot of games some of these when girls you, are playing on blue and white yeah when you when you see the cement enter the legs as a coach it's hard for you to sit there and pass judgment because you have factors that are entering that are beyond both the players on the floor and your control um to where, like, what are you going to tell them? You know, you know, shoot better. Well, I'm tired. Well, yeah. You know, it's it, that's a tough thing to navigate. And that's why I think if you're going to coach a basketball team, obviously this is less organized than school teams or anything like that. I, you know, I, when I coached baseball, we never ran, ever, other than long distance for pitchers because you only run 90 feet at a time in baseball. We maybe did some sprints occasionally. But when I've coached basketball teams, we run about 75% of practice because conditioning is the most important skill in this sport. Good layup to make it 45-32. Too little, too late. And if Saints, Peter, and Paul, look at that steal and the chance for a breakaway layup. Help defense is there and slows it down. Block, layup, did not hit backboard. Like, Canellos has been running nonstop in this game, and she has not broken a sweat. That is so valuable. Oh, look at that dribble. Behind the back, sends it out to the free throw line. Canellos with a beautiful move. Shot was blocked. Bodies flying. Picked up by Papa Flesses. And here they come. Defensive help. Sada Rapolos for the three. No. Rebounded by Saints Peter and Paul. Canellos again. That was a very good decision. She knew that Canellis was not going to be guarded. Let's just waste a couple more seconds off the clock and then throw it to her for the easy layup. Very smart basketball. I just don't think, I think she just didn't see her. I think that, that was the explanation. You know what? Yours I, sounds I, way I, smarter. I don't need your class half empty stuff, okay? She, she, she saw her all her. the way. She just wanted to waste some clock. What I don't understand is, um, I, I, but again, it's tired legs, so I don't want to be judgmental. For sure. Um, the most in-shape player on this floor right now, clearly the best conditioned, is Canelos. 
who has the most points? Canelos. And so if you're going to be a youth basketball team, and when I say youth, I mean high school age and up, where it starts to get really competitive, you have to be good condition. you got to be able to run up and down the floor and create plays all day, every day. Well, and it's so valuable, and if you condition your team, you'll start to realize how much better they get at everything because it's, it's an athletic, physical game. And that's what Jokic struggled with. That shot's no good, rebounded by Saints Peter and Paul. The, the conditioning early on in his career, but not really an issue anymore. I, I don't know. I've never seen Jokic at a full sprint. Because he doesn't have to, because he's so good. <laughs> oh, man. Lead pass to the paint. Ten foot shot. Give it to Papa Flesis. They're still playing hard, even though it's definitely been determined on the scoreboard. Three point shot in transition. Three pointers good. And possibly a fan favorite from the Papa Flesis fan section. Well, just pushed her over 20 points, so it's been a really fantastic game. 21 points for Sada Rapolos. Just didn't get enough from her teammates. But hey, maybe you can get three steals in 30 seconds, make four threes to send it to overtime. Unless Tracy McGrady's walking out of the tunnel, I don't, I don't see it happening. And that was an exciting moment in the NBA. Then of course the Reggie Miller, what was it, eight points in nine seconds? Yeah. Tracy McGrady, the shooting star of NBA basketball. You know, did you? Short and brilliant. And the game ends with a fan favorite knocking down the three right before the final buzzer sounds. Excellent shot by Disho right before the buzzer sounds, but just not enough for Papa Flesses, 49-37. You think they're gonna be pretty disappointed with this loss, knowing that they had a full bench and just couldn't get the victory over Saints, Peter, and Paul? No, I think all those girls know how tired they were. And I think they know that was a big factor in it. And they know it was a lot of runouts and breakaways from Canelos. Uh, I don't know if they'll be highly disappointed by it because if they're in proper condition in terms of just not fatigued, I think it's a little closer of a game. But sometimes that happens in the sport of basketball. Um, again, it's, it's hard for everybody to go for all day, three games, push, 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 push. And when you have Canelos, who's in excellent shape, running the floor constantly, it's, it's, it's tough to go against with tired legs. We're going to take a break. Post-game interviews coming up next. 49-37 win for Saints, Peter, and Paul as they advance into bracket play. You're watching Saints, Peter, and Paul against Papa Flesis here on SBS. Sports Broadcast Solutions is a broadcasting network for everyone. For those of you that just want raw footage of your sporting event but no play-by-play -play or color commentary, you just need us to live stream video from the event over the internet. We will live stream your event on YouTube on our Sports Broadcast Solutions channel. In addition, we also have a dedicated channel on YouTube for live streaming at SBS Livestream. And if you need multiple channels, we can utilize Facebook Livestream and Instagram Live on our channel as well. Options include commercials from your sponsors, professional scoreboard graphics are still available, and of course, yes, pre- and post-game interviews are available as an option if you want. We've been working really hard this whole summer and stuff. Whatever your sports broadcast needs, we are at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. Check us out and become part of the digital sporting world. Sports Broadcast Solutions is a broadcasting network for everyone. We broadcast sporting events for people of all ages, including adult leagues, high school leagues, and kids. Complete with professional-looking graphics, broadcasters, color analysis, and commercials. We do pre- and post-game interviews with the players. In addition, Sports Broadcast Solutions does highlight films, including college recruiting reels, highlight films you'd see on sports news programs, and just simply highlight films for fun. Sports Broadcast Solutions also provides raw footage and live streams if you'd like. Subscribe to us and listen to our professional talk videos about relevant topics in the pro and college ranks. Whatever your sports broadcast needs, contact us at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com and become part of the digital world. Sports Broadcast Solutions is a broadcasting network for everyone. 
At SBS, we offer a professional broadcasting experience for the non-professional athlete. Just like the pros, we offer everything for you. Play-by-play -play commentary. A no-hitter at Kane County Stadium. 15 strikeouts, one walk, one air, and that's it. Color commentary, highlight reels, recruiting videos, and much, much more. Unlike our competitors, we zoom in on the action and always have a live scoreboard with a live time code. If you're ready to have your next sporting event feel like CBS Sports, then make sure to call Sports Broadcast Solutions today. Our phone number is 330-957-7653, or you can go online to sportsbroadcastsolutions.com. SBS, a broadcasting network for everyone. This is Sports Broadcast Solutions, a broadcasting network for everyone. Check us out at sportsbroadcastsolutions.com and become part of the digital sporting world. Welcome to the post game show brought to you by Sports Broadcast Solutions. My name is Kyle Smith. My, my name doesn't matter. This young lady matters, Amelia Andrews, the SBS player of the game, as Saints Peter and Paul with a big 49-37 win to advance into bracket play of the 2022 NHIBT. Amelia, you only had five players. The cavalry wasn't coming off the bench, and you still dominated today against Papa Flesses. What does that mean to you? Even with just five on the court, you dominated the opposition. Uh, it means a lot to work with five kids and play two games back to back and manage to win. You guys are just lethal on the fast break, led by Canelos. How does that happen? How, what have you worked on in practice to make sure you dominate on those two-on-ones and three-on-twos? A lot of like rebounding and looking up and just throwing it and making sure your players are there. Big time win. Canelos, your leading scorer. You were, you were the second and third scorer to go to on the half-court sets. What have you been working on in practice to get ready for a big game like this victory you had over Papa Flesses earlier today? Uh, shooting, rebounding, and then working as a team to get open shots and layups. Have you been, have you been working on your arc at all in terms of your 15-footers and three-pointers? Yeah, a lot and a lot of shots too. What's it going to take to win this tournament from St. Peter and Paul? Um, more effort and a lot of de determination with five players. Final thoughts about the victory going into tomorrow's bracket play? It was really good with only five people. Yeah. That's Amelia Andrews, and that does it for our post-game show. So for Lucas Moore, Mark Carmen, Liam Crotty signing off. We'll see you tomorrow on Championship Sunday. But for now, a 49-37 win for Saints, Peter, and Paul. And we'll see you next time on Sports Broadcast Solutions. Missing your child's sporting event just plain stinks. But you don't have to worry about that anymore, thanks to Sports Broadcast Solutions.